The, the reason for the topic is that determines So I call this work session regular meeting Tuesday, November 9th to order. Uh, Ms. Robach, can we please get a roll call? Ms. Stuart Burtnick. Mrs. Brancato. Here. Mrs. Crossett. Here. Mr. Dixon. Here. Mrs. Eilenberg. Here. Mr. Goddickson. Present. Mr. Lydon. Mr. Martin. Present. Mr. Panofsky. Seven present. Thank you. Can we all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God bless America. Okay, um, for announcements, we had an executive session um, from 515 to 650 regarding legal issues and personnel. All right, did anyone else have any other announcements? Madam President, yeah, I, I would just like to recognize two things if I could, since we haven't had the opportunity to do this recently. But I took note that a week or two ago, the William Tennant football team, which prior to that had been winless, managed to do a wonderful job in their last game of the season and win by a significant margin. At the same time, a young man in 10th grade by the name of Rymir Newkirk managed to score seven touchdowns in that one football game and later was selected as the Courier Times Player of the Week. I think any accomplishment such as that, seven touchdowns, I thought that might be a school record, but I understand someone else may have scored seven touchdowns. I don't know who that was and when, but uh, I think uh, we ought to recognize the, the young man for that wonderful accomplishment and at the same time not to be accused of being sexist. There was a young lady by the name of Michaela Hansen who did a wonderful job in a cross country state meet, was the district was the league champion and so forth. So when we have young people to succeed in athletics in addition to scholarship and, and the arts, I think we ought to recognize them in that way and make it part of the minutes, if I might. Absolutely, Mr. Martin. That's that's perfect, yes. Did anyone else have any announcements? Mr. Dixon? I would just like to give a shout out to um my 
uh, my son's first grade teacher, my son is currently at McDonald and, and to McDonald Elementary in general. I ran into Principal Ortiz the other day and I expressed this, but uh, I have a degree in English literature myself. I teach a class at Rowan University in it. And so I think of myself as being fairly knowledgeable about uh, language and linguistics and things like this. And he comes home to me the other day and starts talking about phonemes as parts of words and asked me, you know, told me what the diacritical mark over a, if you're writing the word cat on the board for a first grader to read, there's that little curvy line you put over the A to let them know it's a short A instead of a long A. I don't know if anybody here knows what it's called. I certainly didn't, but my son came home and did. It's called the brevet. And so I certainly learned something. So I just want to thank Mrs. Dorazio and Mr. Ortiz. I'm deeply impressed with the work going on there. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Anybody else? OK, moving forward. Um, presentations, students and presentations, William Tennant High School, Emma Weinstein. Sorry, just one minute. I'll pull it up. <laughs> While I locate my document, I'm just going to introduce myself. My name is Emma Weinstein. I am the student government junior vice president. I'm filling in for the president today. It's my first time here. I'm very honored. <laughs> You're doing great. Thank you. <laughs> here it is. OK. The major thing that I have up here is that we just closed the first marking period and starting on the 5th, we opened the second marking period and everything so far has been going smoothly. William Tennant's chapter of Mu Alpha Theta, the Math National Honor Society inducted their new members into the club last week. So congratulations to all the new inductees. Key Club will be hosting their annual blood drive starting tomorrow, November 10th, and ending November 11th for all students and staff throughout the school day. Tenant will also be hosting a Veterans Day ceremony this Thursday morning to recognize our veterans and those who are currently serving. Powder Puff practices have started, and we will be having our Powder Puff pep rally and football game next Tuesday on the 16th. Finally, students will be having November 24th and 26th for parent-teacher conferences, and it will lead into the beginning of Thanksgiving break. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you well done. Um, next presentation, Middle Bucks MBIT, um, Elise Jones. Hello, my name is Alizé Jones, and I am a senior at William Tennant High School and a level 300 cosmetology student at the MBIT program. The horticulture and landscape and design program students facilitate the design and installation of the Never Forget Garden at the Washington Crossings National Cemetery. This project in partnership with the Travis Mannion Foundation frames the background of two of the cemetery's memorial walls and is in place to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Tombs of the Unknown Soldier. Students from all three levels of the program participated in the Never Forget Garden Design, Planning, and Installation. Plant material and mulch were donated by Gasper Landscapes and Victory Gardens. Middle Bucks Institute of Technology is hosting a virtual open house for middle school and high school students on Thursday, November 18, 2021, beginning at 6 p.m. There will be a premiere video to kick off our virtual open house featuring some of our SkillsUSA officers. 
You can also explore our campus and programs with an interactive map, virtually meet our teachers, and take part in our questions and, questions and answers sessions using the Zoom platform. Prospective students are invited to sign up to the shadow where they can spend half of the day in a program that they are interested in to, uh, to them. Visit for more information on the virtual open house and access to the exciting interactive event. The Automotive Technology and Collision Repair Technology programs will be raising money for the month of November to help the Auto Dealers Caring for Kids Foundation purchase coats for underprivileged kids in the Philadelphia area. Skills USA is hosting their fall leadership conference at Middle Bucks, my bad, um, at Bucks County Technology Technical High School on November 18th. Middle Bucks will have 21 students attending this event where they will learn about public speaking, governmental practices, team building skills. We would like to remind everyone that you can learn more about the latest happenings at Middle Bucks Institute of Technology by liking us on Facebook, following us on Instagram, Twitter, and visiting our videos on YouTube. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to keep you informed about what is happening at MBIT. Thank you. Thank you. You did a great job. All right, next is um, elementary and secondary school, uh, Mr. Gabriel. Good evening, everybody. Uh, we wanted to take this opportunity on behalf of the instructional leadership team to share a little bit about the emergency and secondary school emergency relief or ESSER funds that we have received uh, in the district. So we want to uh, talk, take a look at basically the why, how, and what behind our proposed use of the grants. Uh, out of all the norms that we typically uh, go through prior to a session, I think two that are really relevant to this particular conversation are keeping decisions in the best interest of our students. And then considering is that statement, assumption, interpretation, or fact. Uh, as you'll see in the next few slides, we leaned heavily on uh, our student population as well as feedback uh, and data in order to make some of the recommendations that we're making and decisions we're making about how to use these ESSER funds. So uh, for those of you that aren't aware, there are currently four grants, four ESSER grants that we've received, the ESSER 1 CARES Act, the ESSER 2, the ARP ESSER, and most recently, the ARP ESSER 7% set asides. Uh, all of these collectively um, are given to schools to address the COVID-19, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Each one carries a little bit of nuance in terms of what it can be used for or the percentage breakdown, which we'll get into in a, in a couple slides. So the next, I'm not going to read those to you, uh, but they're basically just definitions of the three different, the three different, um, three of the four, because um, the ARP set aside is just an, an outshoot of ARP ESSER, uh, the three different grants. Uh, guides for grant use, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at our student body. Uh, and sort of our breakdown, both uh, economics as well as ethnicity, in terms of how we made decisions on the grants, uh, specifically our 41.27%, as you'll see later, of economically disadvantaged students. We're doing some professional development with our staff around uh, teaching uh, with poverty in mind. Uh, so that, that's one of the big areas that we're, we're focusing on. And then feedback. Uh, this, there have been a, a number of different committees. Uh, the Act 48 Committee, which is the Faculty-Based Professional Learning Committee, meets once a year and we gain feedback from our staff. We've mentioned this before the board, we are on corrective action at the state level for a number of different uh, areas, IDEA, federal programs, and then a uh, few of our schools are on TSI or ATSI improvement. Um, COVID related facilities needs, uh, we had sent out a couple of thought exchanges last year throughout the pandemic and we're getting feedback from uh, faculty, students, and parents on uh, needs related to COVID. Our Hanover research, which we've talked about over and over, uh, reports on state of mathematics, reading, English language arts, unfinished learning, which is our term for learning loss, uh, social emotional learning. Uh, as if you remember back in January, we gave you sort of a big picture view of the status of student academic performance and where we sit in the county and in southeastern Pennsylvania. We'll be rehashing a, a newer version of that 
this upcoming winter uh, with updates, student and faculty staff supports, and then uh, again, the, the more thought exchanges. And we now have a portion on our website that has the reports from past thought exchanges from the past about two and a half years that anybody can access and, and take a look at what was discussed to some of the questions we had asked. So we, we really took a look at a lot of the different feedback mechanisms uh, at the different levels to, to make some decisions around programming. Uh, we wanted to share some good news at first and really try to refocus on these moves are being made to help increase student data uh, in, in terms of academic performance. Um, and one of the data points we got back recently from our elementary schools was the use of a program that we've invested in called Lexia Core 5. Uh, it's a reading supportive program. It helps to diagnose and, and work with students uh, on their reading. Um, as you remember from the January report, uh, we're not quite where we need to be yet, at at least the state level. However, we've been making some really great gains early on uh, with some of the supports we've put in place, the extra instructional coaches, uh, trying to get a, a consistent literacy block across the elementary schools. Mr. Dixon, you referenced some of the work that's coming out of our work with the AIM Institute, which we're now in year three of. Uh, and we're going to be continuing that partnership on the science of reading moving forward. So uh, this basically shows from August to October uh, the increase of students from being below grade level in reading to at or above uh, grade level. So it's a really big positive right there. We're having big jumps in our reading um, early on in, in some of the work we've been doing. So back to the grants. And again, this, these grants are part of the supports and the outcome of the data is partially what we're using, you know, a lot of this money for. So these were the amounts we've received for each of the each of the ESSER grants, uh, just over 500,000 in ESSER 1, just over 2 million in ESSER 2, over 4 million in ARP ESSER, and then $337,666 in the most recent, which is the ARP 7% set aside. So our proposal is that by the end of uh, the 23-24 school year, which is when we have to have the money spent by, uh, we will have established uh, a multi-tiered systems of supports, MTSS, for students in reading, English language arts, mathematics, and social emotional learning. We will have established a centennial virtual learning academy in grades K-12, social emotional and academic learning in grades K-12, and have established support for our 5,000 plus students impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. At the same time, we'll have provided COVID-19 related facilities needs and mental health supports for students and staff, through this proposal, as well as, again, support for 5,000 plus students impacted by the pandemic. So ESSER 1, how does it break down? So we basically have three big buckets uh, that ESSER 1 breaks down into. We have uh, money spent on purchase professional and technical services like mental health services, professional development for online and remote learning, salary and benefit stipends for summer programming, supplies, web-based tools for online remote learning, instructional supplies, and cleaning materials and supplies. And then a part of uh, ESSER 1 was we did have to give the non-publics our fair share, uh, their fair share of the money. That was part of the stipulation of the grant. So for ESSER 2, uh, it broke down this way. Salaries and benefits for kindergarten boot camp, for the blended special education teacher that we're putting in place to help support our virtual learners. And again, our uh, social, emotional, academic learning coordinator for the district. Again, technical services, mental health, student assistance program, diversity, equity, inclusion, and education, professional development supports. I mentioned that earlier. That money, money much of that money is going to the Penn Literacy Network. Uh, we're engaging, we have uh, about 50 some teachers right now engaged in a course on poverty and teaching with poverty in mind, uh, which has been a really big hit, so big that I think we're gonna offer it again uh, this upcoming summer and the next year. So we'll be able to foot the bill for that moving forward. And then again, teaching and educational materials to address learning loss or unfinished learning and online learning and then cleaning supplies. And with the American Rescue Plan, ARP ESSER, so in essence, ESSER 3 is the third grant. Again, you can see, I'm not gonna read it to you, but you can see it's, it's expanding the boot camp, the teachers moving into math specialists for MTSS and academic interventions for our lowest level math students or tier two, tier three math students an additional instructional coach at the elementary level. Uh, and then again, just furthering the special ed supports and materials to address learning loss. You'll note too in the notes uh, in this presentation are further descriptions and definitions of each, most of the, the uh, specifics mentioned here in the slides. 
And for the 7% set asides, and again, I, we hope you're seeing the theme here is that we're not trying to do just once and dones. We're trying to establish something and carry it through over multiple years, right? I, I think when we talked back in January, one of the challenges we faced was the amount of once and dones, was the amount of very kind of brief, you know, tried to do something and, and didn't give it a lot of time to really take hold. So we're trying to really put into place, as we've talked about, systems uh, and, and carry initiatives through over multiple years, assess how they're working, change course if we need to or adapt, but really trying to do this over multiple years. So if you look across the three grants, you're seeing a lot of the same in terms of types of supports because we're trying to keep that consistency year to year. Uh, for the last one, this, this was a little bit more specific into how much we could or couldn't spend for certain outcomes. So uh, out of the 337,000 and change, 48 went to after school set aside, 48 went to summer school set aside, and then another 241 went to what they call learning loss, which we call unfinished learning. That breaks down even further, which I'll get to in a minute. But for the after school set aside, it was basically working uh, on credit recovery through a technology called Edgesphere to help support our students who were uh, you know, struggling to graduate. Um, and then the Panther Cub summer program we had presented last spring, really helping our, our struggling learners over the summer kind of get up to speed and try to make up some of the ground that uh, they might have lost during the pandemic. So for that third area, the learning loss or unfinished learning, that breaks down into three subcategories. 30% uh, of that budget had to be going towards social emotional learning. Uh, the 10% uh, was going towards social and emotional learning professional development. And then 8% was going towards reading improvement. And 52% was going towards uh, other expenditures related to learning loss. So that was a little bit more directive in terms of how we could spend the money. But again, uh, trying to be consistent, trying to look for long-term solutions that took shape over time, because we know uh, growing and improving takes time. Uh, you can see it's, it's a lot of the same type of, of themes that run through. We're looking at you know, eventually adopting a social emotional learning curriculum throughout the district, uh, getting some universal screeners in, maybe building some libraries for staff and students. Uh, the Hanover research modules, they have some standalone professional development modules that we were looking into around social emotional learning that we think would be beneficial to use with our staff on our virtual uh, PD days. Um, and then obviously our continued work with AIM, this is helping to support that ongoing work. Another summer, we're going to be trying to offer Panther Cubs over the next couple summers, as well as the edges here, credit recovery. So I know that was kind of fast. Um, all the information is there. Do you have any questions, Mr. Dixon? I, I did have a question. Looking back at the slide that was showing, I mean, all the way back towards the beginning, the reading at grade level. Yes. There were some pretty dramatically high numbers there, like in fifth grade, percentage oh. below grade level. I mean, is that, was that for the entire... Can you explain that? <laughs> like, I mean, 84 84 percent of the fifth graders were testing below grade level, yeah, like for the entire district. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, this is this was the conversation we started back in January, right? I think we've had um, a lot of inconsistency over the past right. number of years. Right. Um, in our in our programming, uh, we've had older resources that have not been aligned or integrated. Uh, we've had resources and buildings that had competing pedagogical philosophies. Um, I think our, our recent efforts over the past two and a half years to try to, first of all, recognize that, and, and number two, address it in a way that we're operating as one district made up of six schools, not six schools independently in a district, uh, is, is part of the work we're, we're getting into. The, the, the AIM professional development is a lot for our teachers um, that's why we're taking multiple years to to roll it in along with that we're making major changes to curriculum we're going to be making making major changes to our resources used to support our students um you know uh, we we need to work smarter and i i, I i'm sorry if the question can't I admit no i didn't mean it to be accusatory towards you i was just surprised at the, the size it, of the number and i understand that there it's, were... it's very high uh and honestly it's high Guys, can you guys like I'm trying to, like, it's okay. know, I need a little quiet, please. Uh, we're going to get more detail with a lot of this in the January in the winter presentation, but it's that high all the way up into eighth grade um, with students in our upper grades testing at a very low reading level. I mean, how uh, much of that, frankly, you know, like, yeah. do we have a sense of, like, 
how much the pandemic basically can, and losing, I mean, you know, effectively at least full instruction, let's call it for, you know, that 2020, the way we did, how much of it is attributable to that? Do you have a sense? It's hard to say. We had the Hanover report, the, the, it was called the learning loss or unfinished learning report that we had about a year ago that showed actually it didn't have it, 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 huge impacts uh, okay. in terms of where we were headed. You know, our, our bigger challenge has been trying to work with resources and our own programs internally that are aligned to the right to reading science the science of reading as well as the, well, the and i know to your point this is dr bedden's mantra since you got here that you know it's got to be one district six schools not how you put it like six six schools yeah six schools you know who happen to share district resources well mr dixon if you recall <clears throat> this is is not very different from when I interviewed for the job and I pulled data. And that would be sure. correct, yes. <laughs> that, um, and one of the things that was shared by staff is that we were doing a bunch of different stuff. And so we've tried to start creating some focus. But we also heard from staff quite often was data being looked at to inform the decisions. So we're trying to be much more transparent and visible about where our students are Yep. and have conversations about student outcome. It doesn't mean that someone's not doing a wonderful program or doing something good, but is it leading to improved student outcomes? And that's where tough choices are being made and even how we're using the ESSER funds to address those issues, which is highly focused on reading and math. Right. Even even the, 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 the change with regards to um, our middle and secondary program, for instance, they're bringing in Springboard. We're trying to get consistency of implementation with our curriculum and talk about standards-based I mean, uh, expectations. Anecdotal, I mean, obviously the numbers are improving based on the Lexia stuff immediately. And I can just tell you anecdotally, like, like my kid but, loves right. that thing, comes home yeah. every day talking about what level he's on. Da, 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 da. I mean, so. But, I, but you know, to be in fifth grade and be in that situation, it didn't just start during the pandemic. Oh, no, no. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously baked in over years. Sure. Just excuse me one second. So if you want to fill out a card, you can. Um, I did. Yeah. OK. I so, just wanted to ask a question on this topic. So you, you can, when, as soon as we get to the community comments, you can ask a question for that one. Mr. Martin, we can follow, we can absolutely follow up with it. Hand me your question, and we'll ask it. But I'll, I'll, I'll I have a question that just, uh, and I will admit my my uh, unfamiliarity with some of the educational jargon. Mm -hmm. But and, and I think I understand what learning is. But could you just give me a simple definition of what? unfinished learning is and what social emotional learning is as opposed to what I conceive as learning so un unfinished learning is the term we're using in place of learning loss um, it's to discuss what kids may have missed during the pandemic right because we everything got slowed down we lost you know uh, the in-person instruction for a while so it was how is that impacting uh, our students in terms of not being able to finish a full year, right? Because we all got we all got the school shut down to two March, you know, two years ago in March. No, right? apply so it was every, trying to trying to make student. that, that no, learning it, up. No, it doesn't, Mr. Martin. And if you remember doing the Hanover research, what they uncovered is that the learning loss term and that more and more has come out about it, is a deficit model term mm -hmm. that is not accurate across the board. To your very point. We found that when they did analysis and we can drill down to each student, some students actually did better while some did. So if you remember that report that we shared with you all, some students uh, had like uh, X percent where they were before COVID and after COVID loss, some actually made more gains. So they believe and more conversation has been around instead of assuming that every student lost something maybe they didn't get everything they needed to meet their whole potential. So thus, unfinished learning was a much more positive term to use. It's than like make up for those that needed it. Right, basically, yes. Okay. Can I, can I ask a follow-up to Mr. Martin on that point? Does that also include... Oh, I hold on. Guys, guys, you're not running the meeting. Thank you. My follow-up question on that yeah. is included in that, un, in that um, 
uh, unfinished learning or whatever. Like, I know that before any pandemics, the standard concept in education was like, you know, kids have the summer vacation. You, you, you learn a certain amount, like let's say in fifth grade, then you come back in sixth grade, and there's always that beginning of the year review, and some students need it more than others, that kind of thing. Is that also included in that concept? It would be like the summer slide. Right, yeah. If you remember that concept, right? Yeah. We always assume that after the, the long break over the summer, kids would come back with a little bit less of where they left off the year because of two months, two and a right. half months. So is that included in that concept? It's, of, it's included. It's the same concept. Thank yes. you. Sorry, Mr. Mark. No, no, I, don't, no I, I'm just trying to understand. I don't understand some of these terms, and right, I'm just right, trying right. to no, figure I mean, out what we're other, talking about here. Yeah, please follow up with the other one. I apologize. So for com just for the com for community to hear, I just wanted to go over what we, um, for mental health and for student assistance, what we've added to the district. Because I know we have a lot of students who are requiring additional assistance with that. Um, what have we added to, to the, you know, for the students to be able to um, discuss things and, I mean, to help them with what they're going through? Can I answer Mr. Martin's question first? Absolutely. Mr. Martin, are you ready for me? I'm always ready. <laughs> <laughs> always good. Thank you. All right. You asked what is social emotional learning? As opposed to just learning, yes. Learning, yes. So I will tell you that the Pennsylvania Department of Education, you know, we have standards and we have standards for academics, but the Pennsylvania Department of Education has also, Mr. Um, Goddison is shaking his head, <laughs> this was his wheelhouse, has um, career readiness standards. And under the career readiness standards, you will see the, um, the guidelines from the state where social emotional progress and learning falls under. So um, CASEL identifies social emotional learning is the process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply knowledge, skill, and attitudes to develop um, relationships, manage emotions, um, and achieve personal collective goals. So it's the self-regulation, it's awareness, um, Decision, responsible decision making, self management. That's what social emotional learning is. And it, if you look at the Pennsylvania uh, standards under the career readiness goals, that's where you see the, where we get our, our guidelines for moving forward with social emotional learning. So it's how do we get along those soft skills and even some hard skills uh, that for some students, they have job coaches. Um, to do that, but we, to answer your question, um, the district has invested in a uh, social emotional academic learning coordinator who has been um, observing, meeting with our school teams, met with our support staff, provided professional development for our teachers during their goal time, um, administrative professional development. Uh, we have uh, nine mental health counselors in the district that we're using to support. Um, we now have 10 um, groups for students. Parents have to, no students attend these groups without parent written permission. There's a girls group, um, there's a boys group, there's a social media group, but all of the things that we offer to our students um, that's different than regular curriculum, parents have to give permission. We, we don't even accept permission over the phone. It has to be written so we don't include kids. We help our teachers with responsive classrooms, supporting students, helping us to self-regulate. So there are a lot of supports. Um, I did do a presentation um, a while ago, but we do plan on giving a presentation with the update of all of the supports that we have put into place. So I can give you more later, but I, I don't want to take up all of his time. And I know you like me to keep it short. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a question for Mr. Gabriel as well. <clears throat> um, we got all this money and it seems like it's all being geared primarily towards elementary schools. And we have middle schools that's in corrective action do we have a way to maybe create a boot camp or something similar to what we're doing down in elementary school for students that's moving up to middle school? So two of the positions that we're investing in are uh, middle level reading specialists, or I'm sorry, excuse me, math specialists. So uh, knowing that a lot of the challenges we're having in the upper grades is due to the uh, you know, challenges we've had in the lower grades over the years, um, and we've talked about those at length last year. So in order to kind of like get the upper grades 
a little bit more stable. We really need to focus a lot of the energy on the lower grades, but we did. Uh, we do, to your point, between the edges here, between the after school programming is for the secondary level, some of the tutoring, uh, the credit recovery is for the after school for the upper grades, and then obviously the two full time uh, math specialists, which are student facing positions. It's important to note out of the four specialists we've added to the grant to elementary, to secondary, they are student facing positions. So that they're there working with students in small groups uh, all the way up through up through eighth grade. And we have included secondary teachers in the AIM training. Uh, so many of our special ed teachers are reading specialists and some of the teachers up through the high school that are hitting some of those lower level readers in the upper grades currently, which again, over time, we're hoping to see less of, but right now, because of the need and what's been going on historically, uh, we are including them in the in the mix. You're welcome. Any other board questions? Thank you, Mr. Gabriel. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Next, we have um, superintendent reports, Dr. Bedden. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, a couple of quick items. One is just to remind uh, the board and the listening audience that we will be approaching uh, inclement weather season. And I would encourage, and we'll send it out in uh, CSD Weekly, but would encourage and remind everyone that we have um, two locations uh, for inclement weather information. Uh, there is a staff one that guides the staff action if we have uh, snow-related or other type of inclement weather situations, as well as on the parent page, that information about where to find information and what what X, Y, and Z means when we uh, have to make a determination about weather. So we just wanted to give people a heads up uh, that that is coming. Uh, as, as you know, uh, the board received uh, a heads up and we received a heads up um, and uh, regarding, uh, and it's now public obviously at the time I wrote this, uh, that the five and 11 year old uh, vaccination uh, is, is available uh, now. Um, uh, just as we did in the past, uh, both whether it was flu shots, uh, whether it was the, the older kids with uh, vaccination opportunities, uh, the district will have vaccination opportunities. Uh, they require parent permission. No student can get uh, tr uh, vaccination opportunities without parent permission. So that is a choice item, not a mandate from uh, the school district. Um, the uh, As you heard yesterday, and the board was given uh, notice uh, when we received uh, early warning notice and then it was public uh, the update from the governor's office about the mandate uh, being anticipated to uh, go through January 17th uh, and that um, then it will shift back to uh, local control um, and that is in part due to uh, they said the vaccination being available to the younger ages but also as part of that they are uh, still maintaining uh, the mandate for uh, early childhood programs because uh, that tool and resource mitigation strategy is not available. It also does not alleviate the requirement on uh, transportation. Uh, that still stays in effect uh, because that is a, a federal uh, mandate uh, that comes down and has not been changed um, going forward. And uh, Mr. Martin, uh, did mention, and I had put a note that we have uh, had uh, uh, several uh, student uh, outstanding uh, performances, so he shared that already. I also want to recognize over the past month that we had uh, food service, a National uh, uh, Nutrition Week, and to celebrate our food service uh, personnel and had opportunity to join them in serving lunch. And then also we had uh, transportation, uh, National Transportation. A recognition we and I had a chance to join some of our uh, tr transportation uh, department staff at a ride along uh, on the bus. Um, we did take the opportunity to attempt to follow up with all persons who uh, shared uh, comments uh, at last uh, board meeting. So either actual direct uh, conversation via phone or email uh, to respond to those issues. We do also have addressing your questions and concerns. Uh, resource that is on our web page that actually drops down and tell people who they may want to talk to and contact uh, to get answers to their questions. As I shared with several of those people, oftentimes the questions that they bring, uh, the board members won't have answers to. And sometimes if it's a school-based issue, we won't have the answer uh, administratively without going back to the school uh, to follow up on that information. Uh, so not being able to or not responding is not an indication of it's not important. Um, 
uh, to the issue, but there is a process and procedure. Everything that happens at a school uh, doesn't come from central office. So we obviously need to reach out to the principal. I encourage, because we want parent uh, concerns and hear them to, to start with the school when it's involving a student or a school-based issue uh, to give them a chance to, re to respond. Uh, and obviously, if they're not happy, then we bring it to the next level to try to get an answer and a resolution to it. Um, but um, we do welcome and encourage. Uh, we try to create a fair and equitable process uh, to uh, the procedures. At times, we've tried to go beyond what is required to accommodate some of the challenges that we face with uh, the pandemic being upon us. Um, and as we are phasing back into normal situations, we are moving back to normal procedures uh, that have been in place and keeping those things that work well uh, to service uh, the information. Uh, we continue to expand information on our website to make it available. And we continue to work on the CSD Weekly that goes out is pulling anywhere from four to 5,000 readers. Uh, and we can see analytics that show how many people are reading it. So I encourage uh, parents to uh, look at that when it comes. If there are suggestions on how to make it better so that it's more easily readable, um, we welcome that because we want to make it so that it is a user-friendly uh, communication to help support the exchange of information. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bedden. Ms. Eilenberg? Thank you. Uh, 4.0, approval of the agenda. Be it resolved that the Centennial School District Board of School Directors, 4.1, approves the November 9th, 2021 Board agenda as per the attached. Are there any corrections that need to be made that are allowed by PA st state law? Uh, Ms. Eilenberg, I would like to make an addition in to the agenda. Could we uh, have a second to that motion? Uh, second. Do we second before we make an addition? Yes. Oh, good. Um, just for everyone, um, today um, during executive session, um, Mr. Panofsky had sent in his, um, Mr. Panofsky, school board director from Region 2, submitted his resignation. In accordance with Sunshine Act, I would like to open the agenda. Can I get a second? Second. All right, and can we um, take a vote on that to add that to the agenda? You want a roll call or a voice vote? Um, we can do a roll call, that's fine. <coughs> Okay, uh, Mrs. Brancato. No. Mr. Dixon. Yes. Mrs. Eilenberg. Yes. Mr. Goddickson. No. Mr. Martin. No. Mr. Lydon. Yes. Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Crossan. Yes. Four four. Amen. I'm sorry. Four yeses, three noes. Thank you, Ms. Robo. So that passes to add that item to the agenda. All right. Um, now that the agenda has been opened, I would like to add item 4.2 to vote to accept the resignation of Mr. Panofsky. Can I get a motion to accept the resignation? Can I get a second? I move. All right. Um, any discussion? What, what is the date of the resignation? Immediately. Um, can, uh, can we take a vote on that? Can I do another All right, call? Uh, this is to accept his, um, motion was made by Mr. Dixon who seconded that. Second. Okay. So this is going to be a vote to accept the resignation. Okay. Mr. Dixon. Yes. Mrs. Eilenberg. Yes. Mr. Goddickson. No. Mr. Martin. Yes. Mr. Lydon. Yes. Mrs. Brancato. No. Mrs. Crossan. Yes. Five yes. Okay, the school code requires vacancies on the board to be filled within 30 days. So the board will accept resumes of Region 2 residents who are interested in completing Mr. Panofsky's term. Resumes letters of interest must be sent to Dr. Bedden's attention by 4 p.m. on November 18th so the board can review them before our next meeting on November 23rd. 
At that meeting, we will appoint a successor who will serve until December 2023. I have a problem with that. That's, that's a holiday week. So people that are planning on going away with their families will be excluded. That's a holiday week for most families. Okay. Is there any other board discussion? I want to thank Mr. Panofsky for his service and dedication to the students. Okay. We will now, we will now move to item five, community comments. The first one would be Chris Badea. So for the community comments, the first set, the first batch are going to be related to the agenda. The second batch, the second set of community comments are just for whatever the community wants to discuss. Chris Padilla from Warminster. Tonight the agenda included changes to the school board policy 903, public participation in board meetings. Although we are thrilled that the violations of the Sunshine Law that have been brought to your attention are being addressed, it appears that the order of things also need to be addressed. Changes should not be implemented and web websites should not be updated before the proposed changes are brought before the board to vote. The current policy is dated May 11, 2021. However, the website stated that the public comment protocol was effective August 17, 2021. Right up until last month, the public comment protocol on the website was updated. No date is reflected for the adoption of change, and yet the green card showed up at the meeting on October 12th. To change policy, you need to put it on the agenda, present it to the board, and vote on it before it is implemented. Is there someone in the administration that thinks the board is just a formality, and that changes can be made arbitrarily, and that you can demand the board sign off on those changes before they are already implemented? The law is the law, and any changes to policy requires a vote. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have a Kiri Sellers. Good evening, Carrie Sellers, Southampton, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm a taxpayer, I'm a community member, and more importantly, I'm a parent. We need to address several issues that have come to light recently. It is appears that there is a concerted effort to deceive the people of this community. I would like to address the edit of September 14th school board meeting, referring to the two poster boards presented here. I'm mostly referring to the comment beginning with we also, uh, but we also. That comment was edited out of the recording of the meeting that was posted on YouTube. The anomaly happens just after the one hour, 41 minute and eight second mark of the video. Who made the call to alter the recording of the September 14th school board meeting? Why was this decision made to remove that statement? We have filed a right to know request regarding this information and let it be known if this board or any school district employee or administrator destroys, modifies any records, you are in violation of the law. If the meeting is posted in the district's YouTube channel as a record of what transpired at that meeting, there is, and there is no verbiage to indicate that what was viewed is altered, you are effectively communicating that it is an accurate representation of what occurred. However, we know that the recording was altered we have the original copy. This action was done with the intent to remove specific information from the record. This is an egregious act and breach of public trust and shows a lack of integrity. Acting with the intent to deceive is not acceptable behavior for a superintendent or any member of the school board of the Centennial School District. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next I have Joan Twig. My name is Joan Twig and we're Mr. PA. Well, I just want to start with we the parents have spoken and we will continue to speak. The minutes of the August 17th school board meeting were voted on and adopted at the September 14th school board meeting. 
To make any changes to any action that has been adopted requires the changes be brought before the board and put forward for a vote. On October 13th at 10.07 a.m., the board secretary changed the meeting minutes and quietly re-uploaded them to the website under the direction of CSD administration in violation of the open meetings law. The minutes are not listed as having been edited. At the file name, and the file name was not modified to reflect that they were edited or updated. We have in our possession an email from Dr. Bedden stating that he is aware of this breach and that legal counsel said that it is okay and a vote was not necessary. This is very concerning. It doesn't matter if your attorney gives your imp you improper counsel. The law is the law and any change to an adopted action requires a vote. What else are you changing without getting approval from the board? Today we received an email, which this is good news, and I'm very happy to share this, that um, we will be able to attend our children's winter concerts in December, which is very exciting because we haven't been able to attend them. I would also like to um, thank the board and um, my daughter's middle school for allowing me to attend her student of the month recognition. It was outside, but I was able to be there after some persistence on being there. So I was very grateful for that, and I just want to encourage parents to, if they don't like the answer, that an exception can always be made, and you should fight. These are precious moments with our children that we're never going to get back. So I'm the kind of person I used to just go with the flow, but now I'm realizing that you have to, you have to make some noise, and we don't get this time back. So thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I ask a quick question? What what is what is the video? What is this video? What? Well, it gets better. It's I don't I don't know. It's it's something was taken out of a a YouTube video is what I'm hearing. Huh? Something was taken out of the September. Oh, we're we can share it with you later. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sure. Okay. So, I, I I'm not familiar with the talk about. I haven't seen the video. So they're more than welcome to send okay. video, and we can take a look at it. Okay. Let's go. And what I'm saying, Madam, I'm losing control here. What I'm saying, Madam Chair, I will. Okay, let him speak. What I'm saying is, I'm more than happy to accept whatever they have to look at what's being shown and follow up with the communications team. So I'm not aware of this. I haven't seen the video myself, so I don't know what they're referring to. But I'm more than happy to look into it. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Okay, next comment is Stacy Hill. Over the course of the last month and a half or so, several right to know requests have been submitted to the Centennial School District. Some appeals have been filed with the Office of Open Records because the district denied and closed several requests without providing the requested information. According to the Office of Open Records, statements of fact must be supported by an affidavit or an attestation made under penalty of perjury by a person with actual knowledge. Under the right to know law, the agency has the burden of proof that the records are exempt from public access. To meet this burden of proof, the agency must provide evidence to the Office of Open Records. It appears Centennial School District is submitting affidavits under penalty of perjury that include information that is not truthful. In one case, videos were not turned over because the records officer claimed that the videos were copyrighted. When the Office of Open Records requested the copyright details in the form of an affidavit or attestation of truth, the response was, well, upon further review, they're not copyrighted after all. And in fact, they've been posted on the district's YouTube page in the public domain for two months. The deception in the initial affidavit could not continue when the Office of Open Records asked for required proof. Again and again, we're finding that to avoid transparency, Centennial School District will deceive, lie, and break laws. What are you hiding and what don't you want us to see? You are tasked with the education of our children. You, you have an open window into our children's lives every hour of the school day but we aren't allowed to ask questions about what you're doing during that time? If you cannot be trusted with these small things, how can you be trusted with the people we hold most precious, much less our tax dollars? The parents, taxpayers, and residents of Centennial School District demand accountability and transparency. 
you are held to a higher standard. The actions of most of this board and our administration are not acceptable and will not be tolerated any longer. You are on notice. By the way, you have been sued oh by the parents of Centennial School District. We have copies for each of you being distributed now. You have been served. Thank you for your comment. Now. <laughs> That's the goal of the monster. Tiffany Budnick, Warminster, Pennsylvania. I am up here as a concerned taxpayer and parent. I have a question to ask the administration. Is the school board meeting posted live to YouTube? Or do you edit it to re in order to remove information you do not want the public to see? I ask this because we have proof that, in fact, they are edited. On September 14th, school board meeting, when the school board was discussing if the district would mandate the vaccine, the following statement was edited out. But we also are told by the CDC that we are supposed to work in a state collaboratively because we are one of only six jurisdictions to have a health department. Every other jurisdiction that doesn't have one has to work directly with the state. We are trying to comply with the guidance of showing that we are collaborating and working, but we are very specific of putting the words per because of the fact that we are not recommending that from us right now. After seeing this, how is the community supposed to trust the administration? I can play the differences, but I asked the community to go on and watch the September 14th meeting and watch the video skip around one hour and 41 minutes in. Record your meeting so that you know what the full meeting is, not just the parts that they want you to see. This is not the only one we found. We found many edits, and I will be more than happy to waste the rest of my time playing the true video. Today, people want to quote Bucks County Health Department. When it doesn't align with what they think, they want us to ignore it. We've been consistent, and that's why we were very deliberate in putting the words per Bucks County Health Department because we did not want to own that as a district. But we also are told by CDC guidance that we are supposed to work in a state collaboratively because we're one of only uh, six jurisdictions that have a health department. Every other jurisdiction that doesn't have one that has to work directly with the state. So okay, we so are trying to comply with the guidance of showing that we are collaborating and working, but we are very specific in putting it forward per because of the fact that we are not recommending that from us right now. Okay, so was put there. So so, so Okay. So now I will pay the video that is I on the website. Speak for other people. I can only speak for me. Uh, that, I respect that. That is, that is not in the plan. Okay. And But I want you to, to consider what you just said. Okay. Uh, I want you to consider what you just said. Things change, which is why exactly. I would never, ever. I will. I will. Okay. Not. Let me, let me talk. Um, okay. So, so that's what I'm saying. Why? So Bucks County Health Department. If I take that out, then I need to take everything out. That they okay, so it, I, is it just I, me, or does that appear? And watch the YouTube video. Right now, it's quick. Is it okay. just me, or does that appear to be two diff completely different parts of the meeting? Okay. <laughs> so moving forward, we're going to go to. Um, thank you for that comment. It sounds like it is. Um, Can I just mention right. that the whole chunk is this board meeting is not currently streaming on YouTube. Right. All right. So next, we're going to go to consent agenda. Uh, Ms. Eilenberg. Thank you. Consent agenda. Does anyone wish to pull anything for six? Uh, for six. No. There's another community comment. Okay. So. Um, about the presentation that yes. they just gave. Yeah, I would have needed that. I wrote that on the card. 
about social emotional learning, the whole thing. That's what I wrote. <coughs> And they need to get back to my child, because I pay attention to her. So we're going to pause that for a second, and we're going to have um, Amy Cons come on up. Sorry, I missed that one. Amy Cons, Warminster, Pennsylvania. To my understanding, based on the presentation included in tonight's agenda, roughly $5.125 million out of the $7.382 million of state and federal COVID and ESSER funds seen on slides 13 and 14 of the presentation is being used for diversity, equity, inclusion, and social emotional learning programs. Although just about every parent can currently say they are concerned about the mental health of their child under the current circumstances, this seems like a gross misuse of funds. The Lexia Core 5 assessment showed on slide 9 of your presentation shows the bulk of centennial students K through 5 are 50 to 80 percent below grade level as of October of this year. Centennial schools rank 10th out of the 13 schools in the district in Bucks County. Out of 500 schools in Pennsylvania, Central Bucks is 17th, New Hope Silbury is 22nd, Lower Moreland is 24th, Council Rock is 34th, Jenkintown is 45th, Abington is 51st, and Pensbury is 59th. Centennial is 195th out of 500. So many students in our district are scoring below grade level. We should not be compromising core curriculum subjects like math, English, history, science, education, physical education, the arts, with diversity, social issues, and anti-racism programs. A wise man once said, I have a dream that my four little children one day live in a nation where they would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Children do not focus on their physical or economic differences, and we should not teach them to start. What we should teach them is that everyone deserves to be treated with kindness and respect. With a program name like Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, or DEI, it seems you may not know the definitions or the difference between equity and equality. Equality is equal opportunity. Equ equity is equal outcome. We should not focus on making all children the same. The priority should be to ensure that uh, we have, they have all the same equal opportunity. Opportunity is there for all the students in our district. The outcome is determined by the individual. At this point, the children of this district, as well as the parents, are being figuratively beaten into submission. The radical agenda of the majority of this board and administration have been overwhelmingly rejected by the residents of the Centennial School District's community. Please remember when voting tonight for these programs, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. No, 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 no. I, I asked the question when Mr. Gabriel was giving it. You said you'd give me a, a couple extra seconds when we had the community comment. Is that related to the, is that related is that to the, the agenda? agenda? It's what he's for, yes, thank you. <laughs> Can I have your floor? Uh, well, this is just my notes. I'll give it to you when I'm done. Yeah, because I need so somebody can get back to you if there's a question. I'll give it to you when I'm done. It's, it's just I scribbled my notes. This is Mike Spurduto from Warminster, PA, part one. Uh, I, on Mr. Gabriel's presentation, I just had a question that uh, with the scores, they were, as I looked at it, they were getting progressively lower uh, grade after grade. So with the teachers, uh, the marking periods that they have, if they see a, a, a student who's struggling in first grade for three or four marking periods, don't you don't doesn't the, the the caution light go off in first grade, or does the kid go to second grade, and the scores get worse, and so on and so so forth? Wouldn't it be an indicator that these students are struggling? Like the first year, they're in one grade, and every marking period, their their grades are going down. I think that's something you guys should look at as a board. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to write on your second card that you had this question. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, Ms. Eilenberg, um, consent agenda? Does anyone wish to pull anything from six?
6.2A and 6.2D. Thank you. Seven. Okay. Be it resolved that the Centennial School District Board of School Directors 6.1A approves the minutes from October 12th, 2021 work session regular school board meeting. 6.1B approves the minutes from October 26th, 2021 committee of the whole meeting. 6.2 6.2B, authorization to employ. 6.2C, leaves of absence. 6.2E, mentor. 6.2F, co-curricular additions. 6.5, waivers, none. 6.6, 6, conferences and travel, none. 6.7, bids and quotes, none. 6.8, assemblies, speakers, and programs, none. 6.9, contracts, licenses, and services. Be it resolved that the Centennial School District Board of School Directors 6.9A approves retroactively the standard contract for ESY services at Martin Luther School for July 6, 2021 through August 6, 2021 for four special education students, district cost $21,000 plus any related services as required by the student's IEP. 6.10, Textbooks, none. 6.11, acceptance of donations, grants, and bequests, be it resolved that the Centennial School District Board of School Directors 6.11 accepts the Ready to Learn grant in the amount of $380,367. 6.12, changes to academic programs, positions, and stipends, none. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Hearing none? Passes 7-0. Madam President, may I ask a question? I, I voted for the minutes because I believe they are accurate, but there was a question raised in, in one of the minutes that I don't know the answer to. Maybe you could provide it. On the uh, minutes of uh, the 12th, I believe, on near the last page, there, it, it references a discussion that was held at that meeting um, in regard to a question that Mrs. Brancato asked uh, and the subject matter was religious exemptions for employees. And it goes on to say that we, we, about executive sessions, blah, 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 blah. And the lawyer got involved. And then it says, Mrs. Crossan said we would have an executive session before the next school board meeting, and it could be added to the next meeting agenda. Uh, my memory is failing, but did we have such... We did have an executive session, um, and it, no, it was not on the executive session. We did meet, what time, at 5.15, but it was not on the executive session. That, to discuss that subject? Yeah, we didn't discuss that subject. Well, that, that, I thought that would be the purpose of... <laughs> well, the way the minutes are, that was what was going to happen with that particular subject, and I just... I, the minutes, I think, are accurate. I'm not questioning the minutes in any way. Right, and, and yeah, and unfortunately, we did. We, unfortunately, we did not discuss it. Um, however, I don't. Th I don't feel it appropriate to discuss for the board because it's certain um, employees' per personal preference, and I don't want to cross a line that I'm not aware that I can cross with talking about somebody's religion. So we do have to discuss it. Yes. Still open ended then. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, 6.2 personnel, and Mrs. Brancato asked a poll. 6.2 resignations. A second? Second. Thank you. Mrs. Brancato? I just wanted us to vote separately. I wanted to vote on it separately. Oh, so you, do you not want it pulled? I did want it pulled so we could vote on 6.2A separately. Okay. Did anybody else have any questions on that one? Is there any particular re I mean, is there something you're concerned about? Just curious. Yes, because I feel like, uh, from my information, we have several resignations that people were asked to resign or be fired. Put yours in, my red. So, you want to do a roll call? I do. Okay. Ms. Robo? Pretty much. 
<coughs> that's going to be for the um, 6.2A. 6.2A. Did we have it read in first? Yeah. She did read it, resignations. Oh, oh it is. Okay, Mrs. Madam, pres are we Madam President. Are we ready? Yes. You all, of course, can proceed, uh, but if there's any concern, the board is entitled to understand uh, why that option was given to the employees, not mandated to the employees. So if you have any questions, we're more than happy to clear that up because it was an option in lieu of because of what happened. Well, we can't discuss that here. No, right? you could recess, right. though, if you really needed to. But I want on the record because that's a misrepresentation the way it was presented. I just don't want to have any part in these people losing their jobs. Okay. So I wanted to vote on it separately. Okay. okay. Ms. Robo, can we please do a roll call? Yes, on 6.2A, Mrs. Eilenberg. Yes. Mr. Goddickson. Yes. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Lydon. Yes. Mrs. Brancato. No. Mr. Dixon. Yes. Mrs. Crossan. Yes. 6 1. Thank you. 6.2D. Be it resolved that the Centennial School District Board of School Directors. 6.2D, uh, change of status. Second. Thank you. And Mrs. Boncato. I just wanted to vote on that one separately also. Ms. Robo, could you please do um, another roll call for 6.2D, change of status? On 6.2D, Mr. Goddickson. Yes. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Lydon. Mrs. Brancato. No. Mr. Dixon. Yes. Mrs. Eilenberg. Yes. Mrs. Crossan. Yes. 6 1. So next we're going to have policies um, that would usually go to Mr. Panofsky. Can I get um, Mr. Dixon, would you please? Okay, um, seven, uh, uh, seven point one, uh, the Centennial School District uh, Board of Supervisors uh, presents the following policies for initial distribution and discussion. Uh, seven point one A, policy three hundred nine, assignment and transfer. Policy seven point one or seven one point B, policy nine hundred three, public participation and board meetings. For initial discussion. Any discussion? No. Moving along, uh, 7.2, the Centennial School District Board of School Directors presents the following policies are presented for adoption. I'm sorry, be it resolved that the Centennial School District Board of School Directors 7.2A uh, adopts policy 609, investment of, school, of district funds, 7.2B, policy 614, adopts uh, payroll authorization, policy 614, payroll authorization, 7.2C, policy 616, payment of bills, 7.2D, policy 618, student activity funds, 7.2E, policy 618.1, clearing funds, 7.2F, policy 6.628, grants. Can I have a second? Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Robo, can we just have a vote, please? You want a roll call on that? I don't think it's necessary. No discussion. And you can call for the voice vote. Oh, can I have a voice vote? Sorry. Uh, voice vote. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, any no's? Abstentions? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Okay, so moving forward, we're going to have um, financials. Uh, Mr. Goddickson, can I get you to take that? I'll take care of that, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> and does anybody want to pull any of the items? Hearing none. 8.1, it, uh, it resolved that the Centennial School District uh, Board of School Directors approves the schedule of bills, investments, cafeteria funds budget reports, and general funds cash receipt summary, October 20, 2021, 
as per the attached. 8.2 approves the budget of the 2021 budget transfer for October as per attached. 8.3 approves the pending bills list as per attached. 8.4 approves the pre approved paid bills list as per attached. Second. Any discussions? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seven nothing. Thank you, Mr. Goddickson. Um, board discussion and comments? Mr. Dixon? I do have a comment. Um, so uh, a brief preface. Uh, I'm sure, like, like me, I'm sure many of you may have had this experience when you were growing up uh, in your homes. You were a kid. Maybe you thought you were clever, or maybe your kids have done it to you, or quite probably both. They come to you and say, or I remember my doing this with my sister to my parents, thinking we were cute. Well, how come there's a Mother's Day and a Father's Day, but there's no Children's Day? And of course, the response came, and I'll bet some of you have heard this one before. Well, every day is Children's Day, right? This is the standard parent response to that kind of thing. I bring that up because at our last meeting, uh, there was a discussion of a book list. Now, setting aside the questions about the process around that book list and whether or not using grant funds for a one-time giveaway is the single best possible use of those funds, those are all legitimate questions and there might be a better process for that. However, I do want to also point out that, I mean, a lot of those books, and it seemed like we were getting awfully close, awfully close to suggesting that the problem with the list of books lay principally with the fact that they had to do with people of color and not people who are white male and heterosexual. Now, I am white male and heterosexual, and I don't want to be excluded or, or, or treated differently because of that. I don't think I'm evil because of that. I don't think anybody like that is evil because of it. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, Mr. Martin, I know you commented on it or brought the, brought the attention of that interest. I don't think that's what you were, saying, you were saying, necessarily. However, I feel like the commentary got a little out of hand. We were very close, I think, to really outright race baiting on it. We have people of color from all those different uh, areas in this district. And the fact of the matter is, if you're teaching history, the history of the Ameri like the United States, for example, United States history or European history, which are two major topics of history in uh, schooling, the reality is you're mostly teaching the history of the government. And the government of most European countries, and certainly America, has been dominated by white heterosexual men, which is just a fact. It's fine. So you're going to teach a lot of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln and James Madison and Millard Fillmore and all the rest. My point, my point is that every day when you're teaching history, you're going through these kinds of things. History class, if for people to be interested and invested in, and the same goes for literature class and, and some of the other liberal arts, you know, People appreciate having voices and that, that share their background and cultural, and, you know, cultural background, their gender, this and that. And that's why you have a Black History Month or a Women's History Month or a Latino History Month. Because every day, every day is White History Month is the answer. And yes. OK, so no. No one interrupts you when you are up here speaking. No one does. Let him finish his, whether, whether it's argument or not, no one interrupts you when you're speaking. Let him I'm, speak. <laughs> My point is not to antagonize it. We're better than this. We are better than this. All you angry people here. There's nothing wrong with teaching George Washington Carver while we're teaching George Washington or Martin Luther King Jr. while we're teaching Martin Luther. That's fine, but what I what I object to that is enough. No one will interrupt you when you were up at the podium. Let him speak. Look, this is hard, right? I mean, it's I've got a crowd of hostile. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. I have a crowd of hostile people who are going to scream and yell at me and tell me I'm a racist. Okay. The reality is there are a lot of people in this community who are hurt by that conversation in this Centennial School District community, and it wasn't really very cognizant of their feelings about being, the feeling, the idea that that list of books was a problem because of who it was about, not what it was about. Madam President, I was mentioned, so I 
would like the opportunity to respond to yes, those Mr. comments Martin. only because I was mentioned yes. by name in those comments, and I respect Mr. Dixon. That was not the intent of my bringing that to, to the board. I think a responsibility of board members is to kind of oversee and look into what books are being distributed, what books are being used in the classroom. And the point, if you go back and look at the minutes at home and the TV, which hopefully isn't edited, that I said that parents should have an opportunity to review the books and have input. In, and that's all parents, not just certain types of parents, all parents, for all students. Mr. Martin. And I think that is an important thing to do. I would have brought the list of names with me that tell fifth graders about all the problems with sports and uh, everything to do with sports, which fifth graders don't need to know. That was just one that comes to mind. That was not the intent. You read that into the comments. Uh, Mr. In addition, we, we oversee taxpayer money and a one-time expenditure of, I think, a significant amount, $92,000, as opposed to putting books in the library. 94000 94. 94, that's even worse. $94,000. If they're in the library for children to get and use, they have multiple years usage. Buying a one-time expenditure of those funds for books that were not selected with any degree of parent input, if you give the parents a list of books that they would like to have their children receive, and they check off whatever the books are, whatever they may be, and any book can be on that list, then that's fine. Mr. Martin. I try to say the school district is telling you what okay. books your children should read. I think that is wrong, and we shouldn't be doing it. I, I want to be clear, Mr. Martin, yes. Mr. Dixon. I want, I want to be clear. I, Mr. Martin, I did mention you by name because I didn't want to be, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be cute here, right? And Mr. Martin, I also preface this by saying, uh, you know, I, your, your points about whether or not a one-time investment, this is a valid point. You know, do you, do, you send, do you buy them for the library or do you send them home? It's a valid point about the process. How exactly do we go about selecting the books? That was not my issue. Nor do I think, as I said, Mr. Martin, that you were necessarily intending it in this fashion. But at one point, if you go back and check the minutes, you turned to the whole group here, because you knew you had them with you, and you said, there's one group that this isn't about, and we know who it is. That was very, very close. I would have said that whether the group was here or not, to be honest with you. That's let's, just let's what I believe. Let's keep this productive, first oh, of all. Okay. But all, all I'm saying Mr. is, like, I, don't, I, felt, I felt in my own self uncourageous in not saying something in that moment at the time that it happened. So now I'm going, now I'm saying something. Having said that, I also want to be very clear. I like Mr. Martin quite a bit. He and I, we talk, so I'm not trying to be personal, but I'm also trying to say, we have to be, listen, this is about civility and how we treat our fellow community members. I understand that there's some frustration out there about the drift of education. We heard from a woman here about, you know, uh, uh, whether or not the topics our, our spending money is, is the situation that you know, what we're spending money on in terms of uh, curriculum or whatever. I will say, first of all, in that comment, and if she were here, I'm sorry she's left, there is the, and I think educators would be the first to tell you this, throwing money at the problem isn't always the solution. Just because you're only spending two and a half million dollars on reading doesn't mean you're not doing something. It means that there's other ways to spend the money. But second of all, I would just ask, I'm not going to be on the board anymore, I didn't run again. But I'm going to ask the, the welcome. But I am that is not that, appropriate. But I am asking that we have a community of people, we have a community of people who, who can be hurt by stuff like that, and that was not our best moment as a board. And I would ask going forward that we think about not doing it. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Dixon. Excuse me. Mrs. Brancato? Yeah, it's a different, it's a different subject. Um, earlier today, uh, the young lady said, um, the powder puff game is on, <clears throat> I'm sorry, on Nove November 16th. So it's come to my attention that powder puff has always been for the entire high school. And it's come to my attention that it is now not for the entire high school. Only the juniors and seniors are allowed to attend. That is a huge football stadium. That is absolutely ridiculous that all the children in the high school cannot attend. There are, there are siblings, 
that would like to attend their, you know, a freshman, a freshman sibling wants to attend their senior, their senior sibling's uh, powder puff game. That's always been the history of the powder puff game. It is open to every high school student. They buy a ticket and they go. So why are we limiting them and who made that decision? Um, I do not have that answer, honestly. Okay, well, I didn't Dr. Even Bedding know might have that answer. That'd be awesome. Um, Dr. Best, would you happen to know? Thank you. So uh, that decision was made by the high school leadership team in conjunction with me. Uh, we've had a lot of issues this year at home football games with student behavior. Uh, our security service that we outsource to has not been able to provide us with any game workers this year uh, because like everyone else, they have the same staffing issues uh, most organizations across our nation are facing. Uh, we had fights at some of our home football games for the first time in eight or nine years this year uh, that we felt uh, concerned about the ability to supervise the students effectively. So this is not a, a COVID-19 related decision. It's a, it's a student supervision situation that we've had struggles with this year. So what you're telling me is that every child is going to be punished for the, for the behavior of some. Exactly. Yes. That's not what I'm telling that you. That is what you're telling me. What I'm, what I'm telling you is that we don't feel we're able to effectively supervise. We have a lot of administrators. They could all pitch in. And, and we or still... In that case, do not feel like we can effectively supervise the students. And we had parents at those games where the issues occurred. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Best. That is not fair. That is not fair to punish every child because of some. And I really don't think that that's not right. That is not right. Okay, so um, for reports. District policy report would be Mr. Kronofsky, but he is. I do have a uh, comment no as well here, please. You want to get the police officer in here? Is that only for Mr. Kronofsky? And then. Mrs. Crossan. Yes. Would you like to get um, Chief Donnelly in here, or is that only for Mr. Kronofsky? Yeah. What are you referring to? Why would he come in here? Why would he? Why would he be? Why did you want him to come in? Excuse me. Why would? Why did you call him? Because you're not hearing what's going on in the back of the room. What's What's the problem? Well, now that Chief Donnelly came in, ask. Tell him what you wanted to tell him. Okay. 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 No, I can't hear him up here. Whatever that is, we don't need it. I'm not the one, okay? I'm telling you. Well, I'm not the one. He could be one of the people. 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 Michael Robert or Buck Naked? I don't know which one he is today. His name is Randy Smith. Thank you, Chief Donnelly. Okay, so moving forward. Um, uh, can I make a comment here absolutely. as well, please? Um, I, I just want to thank the audience and the community for coming out tonight. It is very nice to be at a board meeting and not looking at empty chairs. So I am very pleased to see the community out here. Thank you. That's all. Okay. So district policy report was Mr. Panofsky, so he is not here. Um, I don't have that report. Does anyone? All right. Um, uh, Bucks BCIU, uh, Mrs. Eilenberg. Um, I do apologize. I don't have my a comprehensive report, which I had wanted to have. But I will say that the Bucks County IU is hiring just like Centennial School District, and they're looking for good folks to apply for jobs. If you are looking for a job, feel free to go over to their website. They have uh, the job postings listed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eilenberg. Then 10.3 is PSBA representative, um, Mr. Panofsky. Um, again, I don't have any of his notes. Or um, legislative council liaison is Mr. Panofsky. 
Madam Chair, I can forward to the board the legislative report that the IU provides to the superintendent so I can send that out in a weekly report to close the gap on any information for the board related to that area. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Then we have um, MBIT, Mr. Goddickson. Thank you. Um, I do not want to repeat what our, our wonderful lady from MBIT and our student uh, said earlier tonight. So I would just really refer to last night's um, board meeting. And there were really just two items that, you know, had any real concerns. And one of them was, <clears throat> well, first of all, there was no superintendent's meeting uh, this month. And there was no um, work session for the board as well. And, uh, you know, the two items that came up was um, the policy about the social media. And that was tabled um, because we did not have enough board members to you know, push it through. Um, our two fellow board members from Centennial um, were not present, you know, yesterday. And the last thing that was heavily discussed last night was the health and safety plan that also failed, you know, due to lack of votes. Uh, so that is still reverting back to the initial health and safety plan from August. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Goddickson. Any other board communications? Okay. Um, additional community comments. We're going to start with um, Mr. Spaduto, round two. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mike Spaduto, Warminster. Um, everything just about was addressed, but I just want to go over this. I'd like to address the spending uh, of taxpayer money. Before you spend a dime, you have to do your, uh, spend a dime of our hard-earned money, you have to do your due diligence. Research the subject matter prior to spending the money. The board has the final say, so please ask, ask questions, take your time. You can't make an edu educated decision without the knowledge of the matter being uh, presented. It doesn't make sense to listen to a five-minute presentation and then have to make a decision. The board should have at least seven days to research and ask questions about the subject matter. Before approving anything, ask yourselves, do we absolutely need this now? And how will it benefit our students? And speak about the books that we spoke about at the last meeting. <clears throat> the books that were introduced at the last meeting, no one read the books prior to bringing it up at the meeting, which I found, find appalling that you would just put some, try to put something into the system without reading it. Now, that goes for everybody, not just the guy who presented it. It goes for everybody, okay? My suggestion is, to instead of spending $93,000 or whatever it is, okay, of the grant money, my suggestion is to purchase 500 copies of those books, put them in our, distribute them into our library, and notify the parents that they are there available for their child if they deem it appropriate for them. Use the residual money for other projects in the district. With that being said, I ask the board, President Future, to get involved with our tax money and stop rubber stamping everything that comes up. Look into each major proposal. See if we are getting the best bang for our buck, okay? And do, and do we really need everything and every position that is proposed. I'm looking forward to a change that the residents in this community voted for. Have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Spaduto. Next, we have Paige Mattis. Oh, take your time. Um. My name is Paige Mattis. I'm an eighth grader in Log College Middle School. Election day was last Tuesday, and the four school board members who all won all ran on the promise of making masks optional when they are sworn in December. Is the board really going to remove masks in December? Do you realize how nonsensical that is? I thought the school board was, quote, for the children, but now you guys want to get let us get, let us get sick and possibly die? 
Do not someone... speak while she is speaking. No one does that to you or is disrespectful while you are speaking. Please reset the clock. Even if someone catches COVID and lives, there's still long-term effects like heart and lung problems. I bet you don't want your child going through that unless you're a heartless monster. Nobody wants that. Can you wake up already? We're in the middle of a pandemic that has killed over 5 million people. And if you think that isn't a big deal, that's around 1 in 1,600 people dead. And I did the math myself. Just think about that. Now, kids show less symptoms, but that doesn't mean they can't die from it or spread it to other people. 700 kids in the United States have died from COVID, and most of those were in the last six months. Are you going to wait until one of those kids is in our district? I'm sure you don't want to see your kids suffering from the long-term effects of COVID, and I sure don't want to see my friends like that either. So please, I am begging you, keep masks mandatory until the pandemic is over. One more thing, people who think masks harm children are just not right. The science backs me up. Thank you. Thank you for you speaking. You did a very good job. Next, Tina Cairns. Right, my name is Tina Cairns, 99 Sylvan Lane, Warminster. I would like to talk about the discussion at the last school board meeting on October 26 about books. Using grant money, five books were chosen for the elementary grade levels to, quote, increase awareness and help make sure that all of the different backgrounds in our community are represented. We are trying to make sure there is a diverse collection of materials that reflects the diverse collection of students that we have here in Centennial, end quote. These books were about Black, Hispanic, LGBTQ, and other underrepresented individuals in literature. A 2018 study found that 50% of children's books featured white protagonists, 27% non-human protagonists, and 23% protagonists of color. Yes, more books were about non-human characters than characters of color. It is admirable that Centennial is trying to inject some diversity into the books its students read. This is good not only for those students who identify with these races, cultures, and individuals, but also for other students to expand their understanding of the people and world around them. However, at least one board member did not think this was a good thing. They said, quote, respectfully, you forgot one group in this listing of books, and that's the majority of people in the district who I'm sure you could have found books for, end quote. This board member went on to bemoan the lack of books for the majority three times in the span of a few minutes. Whoever could they be talking about? Centennial students are 71% white, 18% Hispanic, 4% black, and 3% Asian. So the majority of students are white. The words white majority were what they had so carefully tiptoed around. I could not believe what I was hearing. This was said and tolerated at a Centennial School Board meeting and is an embarrassment and a disgrace for our district and township. One last point. The same member started listing book titles during the meeting. Quote, I suspect there is an underlying message in these books. I will cite a few examples. One is called, My Family Celebrates Day of the Dead. I have no idea what that is about. End quote. The Hispanic community is the largest minority population in Warminster and Upper Southampton. If I were this board member, I'd put my family celebrates the Day of the Dead at the top of my book reading list. We don't want our students to have such a narrow view of the world. We need to do better and be better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next community comment, Michael. Megavan? Very good. Thank you. Michael Megavan, Warminster taxpayer. At the school board meeting held in August, I listened as parent after parent, and even some students expressed their concerns over this body's uh, decisions. At some point, in the proceedings, I felt called to the floor to make some comments, and I said things that echoed what had already been said. I also wagered that the board would have our words go in one ear and out the other. I also said that if the board chose to ignore the expectations and wishes of the parents, I'd make it a point to do whatever was necessary to get all of you out and replaced by board members who would listen and allow parents to be involved in how their children would be treated at school and what they would be taught. 
<clears throat> so I emailed, I canvassed, I talked, I worked for the candidates, as did many of the folks out here in the audience. And I spoke to known candidates who would bring normalcy back to our schools <clears throat> if they were elected to the Centennial School Board. Despite slanderous and libelous activity from an individual in our audience against one of our sitting board members, there was a successful, successful sweep of the seats on the board. And that should be a ringing cacophony in that space between your inattentive ears right now. Question, are you listening now? These kids and their parents do not need masking or vaccine mandates continuing to give them anxiety. Nor do they need a curriculum designed to drive social and emotional wedges between them, teaching critical race theory, or do they use the more touchy-feely misnomers, diversity, equity, inclusion, and social emotional learning undermines all that is truly desired for equality. You'll likely hear very powerful quotes on equality, everyone gets a chance, and equity, everybody gets a trophy, from other speakers this evening. Additionally, lessons related to gender identity, sexual preferences, and limited pronoun usage have no place in the classroom or school environment. Topics of this nature belong to the parents as they raise their children to be respectful to all of our brothers and sisters of the human race. We stand in opposition of the methodical indoctrination of our kids. They are not your political or social agenda pawns. In closing, I simply offer this. Father God, give the incoming board members the ability to listen and the wisdom to do all that is right and best for our students. Give them strength to manage the challenges from all opposition. Give them guidance and insight in their efforts to raise this school district to a level for all to be proud. Thank you for your and comment. Father, help those who are leaving to see the errors and actions of their ways. So As I appreciate your prayer, your community comment is over. Amen. All right, next community comment is going to be Lauren McRae. Lauren McRae, Warminster. Two weeks ago, I asked the board why my son couldn't go to the farm and had to watch a video on the farm instead. The board responded by saying they are allowing field trips and I should have asked the school first. They offered to go to Willowdale to find out what was going on. They acted like they had no clue. I later found out that only nine field trips had been approved. Only three were true field trips and were at the high school level. Science trips to BCCC, University of the Sciences, and East Stroudsburg University. Also at Tenet, there was a soccer game, a robotics competition, and a magical performance. Log College has a trip planned to Six Flags in May. The only trips at the elementary level were transportation between Davis and McDonald's for honors uh, uh, band and orchestra. I find it interesting that not one of the three elementary schools had any trips planned for the entire school year. Were teachers not told, uh, told not to plan trips because they wouldn't be allowed? That's what some teachers are saying. An administrator told me that my child's school will have one trip per grade after the new year. It's interesting to think that five schools had no intention of planning field trips until the spring and the board didn't know this. The, board respo the board's response to me was deceptive in that only two out of six schools had a total of four real trips planned. I'm noticing a pattern with policy. It's that once it's changed and freedoms are taken away, they don't come back until people speak up. Is that what happened? Was the policy no field trips last year and that changes were just not communicated for this year? There is a disregard to what is important to parents and taxpayers. You don't care how I feel because it's not of importance to you. What is important to, what is important to me in, is in the way of your personal agenda. I express my concerns about the staff testing required um, their DNA to be harvested for 10 years for unknown purposes. My email went ignored, and when I called out during the last meeting, a board member laughed hysterically. The majority of this board is out of touch with what the majority of the community want, and by the way, we're not bad people, um, and, and does not support the extreme agendas and policies of the board. We are seeing the fallout of these extreme policies as many staff members are resigning. It's a suffocating environment, and they are easily finding worse elsewhere. We need politics 
Oh, I'm sorry, policies to conducive to retaining staff, not ones that make them run. It's confusing to me how you ignore our pleas and then complain how we make a big deal out of things, like how every other school is going on field trips using lockers and having the option of in-person conferences. You are the ones breaking the law meeting after meeting and then shame us for holding you accountable by speaking out. You won't give us an inch because you have an agenda and it's not ethical to force your own personal liberal agenda on other people's children. It is the complete lack of respect for others who live differently and I would never push the way I live on other people's children. When the pendulum swings too far in one direction, you can always expect it to swing right back the other way. You should have walked down the middle path because we all ultimately have the same goal and that is the best possible outcome for our kids. It's time we fo start focusing on our commonalities instead of our differences and instead of installing the person who lost the election, which you're going to do because the former board member had announced basically that that's what you're going to do, I think is shameful. I think is really shameful. And at no time in history have people forcing others into compliance have been the good guys, freedom always. Okay. Next comment is Nicole Rainier. Thanks. Uh, Nicole Rainier, Warminster, PA. Hello, for those of you who may not know me, um, I went K through 12 through Centennial School District. I currently serve as a violence prevention policy specialist working in the realm of dating domestic violence, which includes bullying. Bullying is something that many students struggle with, often because they don't fit in with their peers or the majority of people around them. To be different can be extremely isolating and lonely, especially as children develop and grow into adulthood. I wonder how many people in this room can remember a time when they didn't fit in with the crowd due to some part of their identity, what that felt like, especially as a child. I imagine those who may be struggling to remember such a time would identify themselves as part of the majority. I want to explain to everyone listening that those with any minority status have a disproportionate burden placed on them to fit in. For example, students who identify as LBGTQ have higher rates of suicidal ideation and struggle more academically. I question why any board member would want to perpetuate this isolation and exclusion for any student from the majority. Might I remind everyone too that one of the fundamental responsibilities of school board directors is to quote, ensure educational opportunities for all students of the school district. Let me repeat that, for all students of the school district. I was appalled at comments made at the last meeting calling to dismiss books designed to help students who aren't part of the majority fit in to help indicate to them that they too are included and just as important and valuable as any other student. I can't help but wonder as well how many school board directors here remember the case of Brown versus Board of Education. More specifically, a fundamental part of that ruling called the doll test. The doll test took young children and asked them to choose between black and white dolls, to which they chose the white dolls. Even black students chose the white dolls. Psychologists detailed the harms this had on black students, the way the desire for whiteness made them feel inferior and caused devastating impacts, a reason why schools are now desegregated. I encourage you to read more into those accounts. They're heartbreaking, but integral to how we move forward in our educational institutions to in fact ensure that all students are valued equally. I want to also say, like one of our board member's grandsons, I too cheer on the Phillies and the Flyers. And that yes, there are people of color on those teams, but there also aren't any women. It's important for young girls, especially girls of color, to see themselves reflected in professional sports too, which is why the book about Naomi Osaka is vital to education. And get this, it also teaches boys that professional sports teams can also include tennis. I question what it is that any school board director is afraid of with these books. The inclusion of these books opens opportunities for children, for students. Why would we want to limit that? Aren't schools literally institutions of education? Isn't the point of education to learn something we don't already know? To expand our horizons so that we can grow and prosper? I hope everyone here tonight thinks about this, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, next comment is going to be Heather Zykel. Zykel. Heather Zykel, Warminster. When I spoke the first time about two months ago, I addressed the board that due to the dictatorship and controlling tactics 
that this administration has been demonstrating that you will see good, valuable, and irreplaceable employees leaving. Well, guess what? Employees are leaving. So how many more employees do you want to see, do you really want to lose? We, the community, know what is best for our school district. You are not focusing on what is best for this school district. If you were, our school district test scores would not keep dropping. Our irreplaceable employees would never think about leaving, and our students would be able to improve and thrive. As of now, the reality of this school district is you, that you are focusing on is embarrassing, disgraceful, and unacceptable. We talked about the uh, reason why we're not having the powder puff game with all the students. Maybe if we didn't focus on diversity and teaching diversity to our students, then you wouldn't have kids fighting on school grounds because, in, because everyone is equal in God's eyes. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so thank you for your comment. Um, Ms. Crossan. Mr. Dixon. Or I just want to say one final thing here, um, and to Mr. Martin, because uh, I I did not know that my colleagues or my and Ms. Cairns, and obviously they ran for office. Ms. Cairns and um, uh, uh, Ms. Rainier were going to be here. I thank them for them, thank them for their comments. I wouldn't mean to single you out personally. I mean, again, I was trying not to be cute. And I know Mr. Martin to be a man of good character, and I don't think that that was really, I don't think any of his comments were coming necessarily from a place of true, uh, uh, you know, hatred or anything like that. That wasn't the point. But the point was, still, we have to manage how we discuss these things and know that our words mean things to people, that's all. And I'm saying, you know, as an exiting member of the board, uh, we could do better than we did at that last meeting, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Um, moving forward, um, scheduled board meeting calendar events, Mr. Goddickson. Thank you. <clears throat> on the following <clears throat> board meetings and on the calendar, Tuesday, November the 16th at 7 p.m., BCIU uh, board meeting at the BCIU in Doristown. Thursday, November the 18th, 6 p.m., MBIT open house. It's a virtual presentation, as mentioned earlier today. Tuesday, November the 23rd, 7 p.m., Centennial School Board Meeting Committee of the Hall, right here in this boardroom. Wednesday, November the 24th, all schools closed. Thursday, Friday, Thursday through Friday, November 25th, 26th, all schools and offices closed. Friday, December the 3rd, Early dismissal, K through 5. Monday, December the 6th, 7 p.m., Centennial School Board meeting, reorganization meeting, right here in this boardroom. Monday, December the 13th, at 5.30, MBIT Executive Council meeting. This meeting has been canceled. Tuesday, December the 14th, 7 p.m., Centennial School Board meeting, regular meeting, right here in this school, uh, this boardroom. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Goddickson. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.